This is Q Bible, Quantum Bible 3. Looking at the bits, measured bits. This being a measure 7, word 7. Heads. There's so much been made of this. And this is where the meter is going to really make a difference. Ten horns. Now, in classical dispensational theology, and pretty much everybody else, everybody's saying, okay, in the end times, it's going to be a confederation of seven kings, because we're going to be told that they're kings later. So therefore, seven kingdoms and the ten horns imply that sort of like power sources more than just kingdoms. And of course, we got Daniel 7, where of the ten horns, three of them consolidate under one. So it ends up being eight. So it starts out at seven and it ends up being eight, which we're also going to be told later on. And they're all focusing on the end times. In the final time before Christ returns, or the final time, yeah, well, final time before Christ returns to the second advent, whether you believe in trip rapture or not. Because preterists interpret this as still being end times, but that we're already in them. And that this is basically how it's going to end at some point, without a rapture. Okay. But what they don't know, because they don't know the meter, is that since this is the anaphoric center, and it's in the past, that the time that this is set to gives you better information about the meaning of ten horns and seven heads. So you get a picture of the configuration that the Bible has in, you know, God has in mind when he's saying this. Because it's a past configuration that's going to repeat. Okay? Now, one of the big things that happens at this point is Paul's meter, which had been tracking all this, and actually John is tracking to Paul in Ephesians 1, 3-14, Paul's meter stops here at 434. Okay? And that's 434 AD. So that's nine years prior to this. So, Kerata Dekata Kai Kefa. Or Las Fa. Alright? So, Paul's meter had stopped here. But it's okay that it stopped there because Paul's stopping in Odevacher, who, who's coming up real soon. And he's a kid at the point that Paul stops. He's like 15 years old. And that's his age as a manhood. And that's a sort of Greek drama technique where you end at a beginning because you already know what's going to happen next. So our model for how to interpret hepta kephalas, seven heads, Kai and Ta the Ten Horns is back here during this time. Okay, well, what was it during this time? Well, Honorius died in 423. Arcadius had already died. That left two teenagers run by their advisors who were adults in the East. In the West, just after, not too long after the sack of Rome, Gallia Placida, the sister of Honorius, had come back. He married her off to, I forget, some wealthy old general or something. In spite of the fact that she'd already been married to a, a Visigoth or a Vandal chieftain. And she has a kid. Okay? That kid is known to history as Valentine the Third. But he's really young. So we got kids in the east, which means adults of jockeying with each other behind the scenes, and kids in the west. So what does that tell you? Power vacuum, jockeying for position, 
And that's exactly what this shows right here. See? Here we go. This goes all the way back to 395 when these two kids were born. Alright. And now we just talked about Onarius dying in 423. That's him. And look at all these other emperors. Well, they weren't really emperors. They were wannabes. And they all took over certain parts of the Roman Empire and said, Okay, I'm emperor now. And for their part of the Roman Empire, since he was too weak, he couldn't stop them. On top of that, there were all the Vandals and the Visigoths and blah, 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 running around. Okay. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, that qualifies ten horns. But, These ten horns are after 426 when Honorius is dead. These ten horns are before he dies. See, well, this guy's a little bit over. Otherwise, they're all like, while well, he's still alive. So how are we talking about ten horns? And this is Gallia Placida's kid, his sister, Valentini III. And he's in the West, technically ruling from 425. So there's a two-year hiatus, and here's the two years. So there's something going on, vacuum of power, jostling for power, from the time he died until the final ascension of Valentinian III. Now, what was it that happened? Well, all kinds of stuff that happens when you have an interregnum. I mean, you know. Do you really need to hear the story? Haven't you heard it enough? Alright. But it, even though the timing is a little different, it gives you the flavor. And if it's happening here, and he's a kid here. Okay, he doesn't stay a kid. But at the beginning of it, he's a kid. See, 425. It's really her ruling as his regent. Well, it's not too hard to understand that if you had all this going under the guy, her brother, now that she's regent, something like this is going on at the beginning of the ostensible reign of another kid in the West, Valentinian. Then we come to the Eastern Empire. Arcadius had died earlier. This was the time of Polcaria, the running Theodosius and that that's a real contentious story they ought to make a movie out of that and it looks like oh well, he had this really long reign well not really because he was a kid when he started and it's one advisor versus another advisor, advisor versus another advisor versus another advisor behind him so that's in the east and then you got this other kid in the west again with his mother as a regent but you just know that there's a lot of jockeying for power going on behind it. So to say seven heads, well, what are they? Well, let's see. We got one in the west and one in the east. That's two of seven. The titular emperors, okay? Valentinian Theodosius. That leaves five. You got Polkiria in the east. That leaves four. All right. Then they each had advisors, at least one, usually a general, and, and some some spectacular stuff going on there too. Um, so that's two more. So now we got five, and then you got Gallia Placida. That's six. Okay. So what? The seventh might be a cleric or something. You see the point? It, there's too much being made about who these seven are and not enough made about the character of what's being said here. There is a splitting around of power. You could call it shared power if you want. But there's more like jockeying of power. Alright? And ten horns, which means there's some overlap between the head and the horn. Because, you know, one head might have two horns, one head might have one horn, one head might have no horns. 
This is talking about sort of like basically court intrigue. That's the point. That's our model. And it's from the time Honorius died, at which point we have kids in power with their parents. Well, Polkiria and Theo didn't have any parents left. But um, Valentinian's mom. So it, there's a weakness at the center. And we're talking about the center. There's a weakness at the center, which allows for those alongside or supposedly assisting to jockey with each other. Not unlike Trump White House right now. Hold on. It got really hot in here. So we're looking at a power vacuum or a power jostling or instability of who's in charge going on. Now I mention that because that's a frequent thing in history. Alright, no matter where you look in history, this is very common. And I, I have to ask, you know, I know it's like the, the big topic. Well, which of the seven nations in the revived Roman Empire confess? Well, maybe that's not the point. Maybe the point is to show the instability due to weakness at the center. So you got lots of shifting alliances within each court or within one court. Whoever Rome ends up being is going to have a lot of too many cooks in the, in the soup in the kitchen. You see the point? And that's why Daniel 7 makes a whole lot of sense because you got this basically the same the same culture or one civilization gives way to another civilization gives way to another civilization gives way to another civilization and each one is sort of forming on the backs of the one that's just dying or morphing. And that book that I told you by, by Dr. Theodore about the myth of the decline and fall of Rome, okay, because of course, you know, we're talking about wondering at the beast that was, see here's was, I'm going to cover that in a minute, that he poses in his book, starting in chapter one of his book, he's like, why are we calling it decline and fall? What if it just morphed? All right. Isn't that the same kind of thing here? Yeah, there's obviously a decline in the sense that we got kids on the throne. But it's a jockeying for power. And the diffuseness or the, the balance of power is sort of shifting. So it doesn't really matter where it is. It matters what it is. Am I making any sense? Alright, because that is definitely what you see here. Look. All right. While Honorius is alive, we got all these wannabe emperors, each with their own little territory, fighting him, and he's losing a little bit of territory to each of them. He ends up losing a lot. Okay. Meanwhile, all right, Gallia Placida finally returns from the sack of Rome and her her husband who died, and Honorius sends her to this other rich guy. I forget, it might have been one of these guys, and she has Valentinian and then he's the last kid standing and all the rest of them die out and he ends up being um, being crowned all right in the east it's a similar situation Arcadia's died but there's a little more unity there and that's due to Polkiria she decides to, te to tell everybody she's she's married Theotakos all right, which basically means, you know, I'm going to make myself a virgin and you have to worship me. And I don't, she's just wacko. Anti-Semitic, behind the, the Council of Chalcedon, had a lot to do with it. I mean, she was probably really smart for her age. Theodosius apparently fell in love with the wife that she picked out for him. And then the wife and her are having at it all this time. So that shifting of power is more 
particular and concentrated versus what had to be going on up here. Because if you got all this backdrop while Onarius is alive, how much more were there other contestants once he died? Now maybe those contestants weren't worth much or the guys doing the Rome thing here didn't want to include them, but there have always been a lot of wannabes. And maybe Galia Placida, because she was related to the Goths and all that for a while, the Goths or the Vandals, I think it was the Vandals really. Um, so they were, they were maybe helping her. But you got some kind of jockeying for power going on, and if not that, then within the court. Alright? So why can't this, given that being the history and this being tagged to it, because, again, with Greek, you do not have to put this text in this order. He could have put it up here. He could have moved this sentence all around and reversed the order of the sentence. And you still get the same content out of it, but not the same timing. So what if all this means is, well, you see, there's the shifting alliances all the time. That's certainly true in history. And this is the period he's using the market which we know of the shifting alliances and of course if you were living then you would know about it it would be on everybody's lips the gossip people always talk about the rich and famous and the powerful and the governor and governing so everybody would have been talking about this and if you were reading your bible at this time it's like oh okay i know what hepta kephalas kadeka karata means kerata means okay i get it there's no biggie but it ends up being an important model for the future tribulation so that you don't misinterpret it. Because what if there are physically seven nations? Well, there are probably going to be seven nations, so what, almost 200 now? Why are you busy looking for particular seven nations when that's not even necessarily what's meant? You see what I'm getting at? Rightly dividing the word of truth, truth is going to be real important in order for your life to be saved. Okay, so I'm s trying to say to you, I don't think this means necessarily, it might, seven particular, particular nations. And ten, you could just be ten power sources, and they could all be within one court. All right, you can call them, it's, it's going to say it's seven kings, but it, well, how about seven wannabe kings? You see the point? So if I'm at court in Western or Eastern Empire, I'm Gallia Placida, I'm one head. I got my kid, that's two heads. And I'm going to have at least one advisor, and the advisor is being my advisor because he's a kingmaker and this gives him his power so that's three heads I'm going to have a cleric because we're religious in these days that's four heads right there that's before I even look at the other empire you see the point you can see where this would turn into and somebody consolidating their power so instead of being ten power sources or ten power divisions or ten power what do you want to call it power influence centers you end up having one or eight. See? Okay? I kind of spent too much time on that, but it, it's, it's a sticking point to me that they just read it one way and they don't stop to look at the history. Of course, they didn't know what history to look at until you counted the meter. See the value of the meter? Okay. Now, here's where we get to the really kicker. The beast that you saw, and here we go, was was now this is really the, the biting sarcasm here is so much it's unbelievable everybody and his brother will tell you it's a political entity that used to exist in the past and they all say well you know that's ancient Rome under Augustus or whatever but we just saw here diffusion of power because we got in the east two kids on the throne and in the west another kid on the throne with mommy as regent 
isn't that a type of past? The current right now is what? Weak. Signified by what? Heptakephalus kaita deca kerata. Vacuum. Jockeying for power. Alliances within a court. So that's a was. It had been, but not now. Like a real king at a throne. You know, we had Arcadius, who really wasn't much, but at least he had some authority that everybody respected. And we had Honorius. Well, they're both dead. So it's was. So when we're talking about the beast that was, we're looking at backwards. We're going backwards. We're looking backwards to a better day. To a better time. Backwards. That's the key. Was. And if things aren't very good now, because you got seven other heads that you're dealing with and ten other horns, then was. You look backwards and you say, Oh, if only it were like it was. Okay? That's real important. Because one of the biggest things that happens during this period to try to get things back to the way they were is the stinking Council of Chalcedon. And this is going to do more to cause war and trouble for the next thousand years than any single thing. Our gal Polkaria started it with her Mary Theotaka stuff. And she wanted to get them to recognize her. So she was a big agent in this. But it really was part of this seven heads and ten horns thing. Okay? Where they're all trying to say, okay, if our brand of Christianity versus your brand of Christianity, which is of course how this historical trend started up here with the Constantine's kids, it ain't over yet. Council of Chalcedon is basically trying to say, okay, we're in Latin Rome. Actually, it wasn't even in Rome. It was in uh, Turkey. New Turkey. Anatolia. And we're gonna say, we're gonna, we're gonna put up a list of all of our doctrinal beliefs that we call true. And if you don't adhere to them, you're a heretic. And that means we can confiscate your property, especially if you're a Jew. And Polkiria wanted to make sure she was queen of it. Which, given what we just saw up here with the seven heads and the ten horns, she probably was jockeying around a lot of different influences that they were trying to, you know, take things from her. So she thought, well, I'll go the religious route because I'm a woman and I'm not supposed to want power. So I'll just pretend to be a virgin for the rest of my life. Which she did. And that cemented it for her. But it also cemented, hi, this Chalcedonian thing, it's going to determine Byzantine history for the next thousand years. Well, actually the whole history for the next thousand years. You're Chalcedonian, you agree with all these things that we put in the Council of Chalcedon, or you're a heretic. So, The beast which you saw was, is no longer. Past tense. So they're trying to get it back to the way it was. And what is that? Well, that's back here when the Constantinian kids were fighting with each other over the same thing, basically. What's the definition of God? Did did Father did did the Holy Spirit proceed from Father or from Father and Son? And is he one nature or two natures or sixteen natures or how many natures? And is he really only God? And is he really only human or is he just God and just human and sort of mixed in somewhere because of the cross? That whole shtick was made part and parcel of governance 
unity of church and state, which Revelation 17 is making fun of, since Constantine and his kids, because remember, they had back up here the Council of Nicaea, right in here. And what did the Bible call that? I didn't even cover that. I skipped over it. Babylon the Great, mother of harlots. Those were terms used for Constantine and his machinations and the churchy people who he, who was trying to run him and they were trying to run him and he was trying to run them and they were all just the same thing with the seven horns and the ten heads. Ten horns and seven heads. It was all going on up here. So is that the way you want to go back to how it was, Council of Chalcedon, in 451, down at the top of verse 8? You want to go back to how it was in black? Hmm? <coughs> and the answer is, yeah. They want to go back to how it was because, see, we're at, we're at 451 and we don't really remember what it was like 100 years prior. And whatever it was 100 years prior, we've romanticized it. And besides, that was all, you know, religious power and we're, we're, we're in the White House now. So, in a way, you've got a unity of church and state in the very worst combination. You've got a bunch of theologians who wouldn't know the Bible if it bit them faced off with some kind of political splitting so that's what this is talking about this is the politics and they want a little bit of the action like they used to have back when Babylon was great and the mother of harlots in other words they want to go back to harlotry and that's what they're doing here. So we can say we're the top Christians and you're the heretics and then we can take everything you have especially if you're a Jew. We want to go back to the way it was when it was purely under Constantine. Yeah, forgetting or not remembering or never knowing. That's Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and, uh, and of all the abominations of the earth. That's the epitaph of that period of Constantine, which is kids continued, which ends up forming this anaphoric center from verse 6 to 8. See that? Now, happily for him, at the end of this period when the Council of Chalcedon is going on and Pope Curia is getting crowned queen of it, her brother dies. So he also, this is the killer, see this is the word was, an imperfect tense of I me, used to be as a continuing state but not now. Okay well thankfully for him in 451 when all this crap was going on he dies. So he too was but is not now. And I forget how he died. I want to say he fell off a horse or something, but I'm not sure that that's how he died. But he was. He's gone. He's part of the was. So whatever was in the past, he's part of it. And all you got left for current is this woman who says she's going to be a perpetual virgin. She actually marries another guy. This one. This one here, right here. Pokeria marries, marries, and they work out, oh, we got the Western Empire, we got to the East, we got to the East, okay, and, and, and she marries this guy, see, married to Pokeria, granddaughter of Theodosius I, and they never have sex, because they're so holy, which ends up creating an unbelievable problem for the rest of history, but I digress. Okay, this is our like paradigmal period that the, that all the historical trends are going to come out of. And your first is a looking and a longing back for what was 
under Constantine. Because that was the whole purpose of the Council of Chalcedon. To get back to religious purity. Which is really get back to the pure apostasy that they used to have. So that they have a counterweight against these political people. Remember it's going to tell us later on that the, the, the polity hates the religious, the, hates the woman. Okay? So it's this tension between the religion and the polit political leaders. Alright? Thankfully for dear Theo, he, he's out. He was. He ain't there now. So he's a was. He's part of the past that they claim they want to go back to, but really what they want is political power and say that they're pure. Okay? Now, this is a killer. And is not. Okay. This was 451. I had to break the clause because it's a dramatic separation that the angel's making. It was so cute, I just had to do that. We want to go back to the past, to our pure past, and be pure Christians. Meanwhile, the only guy who actually escapes is Theo, Theo the, the second. Alright? So he's was. He's in, he's in heaven. Okay. But, if you want to go back to the way it was, then what you're trying to say is you want it to be what was, to be what is. Well, you're not going to get that. And is not. Now remember, Theo the Second died. Right here. So here we have another Kai. So who's the new ruler at that point? In 451. Hmm. Well, let's look. 451? Well, maybe tail end of 450. Depends on the fiscal. Okay. Martian. Who is going to be celibate? Well, he's married to, I don't know, she's got to be in her 40s at this point. Paul Carrea. Who's declared herself to be Mary Theotokos, mother of God. I, I'm so glad I wasn't around. She would have been a female Trump if ever there was. Okay. So he's the new Kai. Okay, but wait a minute. Kai, not Kaiser, ha ha, making fun of him, but Kaiser, not, fact, factual not, is. Okay, now let's have a look. Here's Martian, and it lasts for seven years. Okay, seven. Let's have a look at him. There we go. This is religious policies. There, he calls a fourth ecumenical council. See, that's later, 451. That's the next one. Okay. And the religious controversy surrounding the beliefs of Nestorius, Eutychus, and the other monophysite. This is going to dominate history for the next thousand years in that part of the world. They're going to keep on fighting over this. They never get it over. All right. Fortunately for Valentinian, he didn't last that long. Okay. And then Marcion is still around in 453. Okay. And then, and then, and then. Oh well, it's it's overlapping the time that's going on here. What Marcion did, and it's kind of mixed in with Theodosius, so it's not really helpful. What I want to say. Oh, this might not be the right one. The point is they're fighting over religion, of course. And they're having a problem with the tell the Huns, not necessarily. Well no, the Huns were in the East. Oh, I don't remember what I wanted. I'm going to have to shut this down and remember what it was I was trying to find. Okay. But you're getting the point that there's something very witty about to happen here. Because here's Martian. And he's a Kai. Married to a woman who's not going to have any kids. And is real self-righteous about it. Apparently he was too. So 
So what is Uk Esten? Oh, what kind of juicy thing is that going to be? And that ends at 455. Oh, I guess Valentinian, Valentinian dies at 455. So we're going to have to talk about that in the next increment.